Can you explain the advantages of using Kotlin over Java for Android app development? Certainly. Kotlin offers several advantages over Java, including concise syntax, enhanced null safety, and improved readability. Kotlin's type inference system reduces boilerplate code, making development faster and more efficient. Additionally, Kotlin seamlessly interoperates with Java, allowing developers to gradually adopt it in existing projects. What are the key differences between VAL and VAR in Kotlin? VAL and VAR are both used for variable declaration in Kotlin. VAL declares a read-only, immutable, variable, meaning its value cannot be changed after initialization. VAR, on the other hand, declares a mutable variable, allowing its value to be reassigned. It's a good practice to use VAL whenever possible to ensure immutability and reduce the risk of bugs. How do you handle memory leaks in Android applications and can you name some common causes? To handle memory leaks, I follow best practices such as using weak references, avoiding unnecessary object references in long-lived contexts, and releasing resources in a timely manner. Common causes of memory leaks include holding references to activities or contexts in long-running background tasks, registering listeners without unregistering them, and creating static references to objects that should be garbage collected. What is an Android fragment and when would you use one in your app? An Android fragment is a modular component that represents a part of an activity's UI and has its life cycle. Fragments are used to create more modular and reusable UI components in Android apps. I would use a fragment when I want to create a portion of the UI that can be added, removed, or replaced within an activity. Fragments are particularly useful for building responsive UIs for different screen sizes and orientations. Describe the Android activity lifecycle. How can you handle configuration changes like screen rotation? The Android activity lifecycle consists of several states, including on create, on start, on resume, on pause, on stop, and on destroy. When handling configuration changes like screen rotation, I use techniques such as retaining fragments with set retain instance, true, to preserve critical data during configuration changes. I also use view model to store UI related data, ensuring it survives configuration changes. By handling these changes properly, I can provide a seamless user experience without losing data or the current UI state. Explain the purpose of the Android view model and how it helps in maintaining UI related data. The Android view model is part of the Android architecture components and is designed to store and manage UI related data. It survives configuration changes, such as screen rotations, and helps in separating the UI logic from the UI components like activities and fragments. View models are particularly useful for preserving data that should persist across UI changes, reducing memory leaks, and making data available to different UI components without direct coupling. What is data binding and how does it simplify UI development in Android? Data binding is an Android library that allows you to bind UI components in your layout files directly to data sources, such as view model objects. It simplifies UI development by eliminating the need for boilerplate code to update UI elements programmatically. With data binding, you can bind UI elements to data properties, and the framework handles the updates automatically when data changes. This reduces the risk of bugs and makes the code base cleaner and more maintainable. Describe the Android app architecture components, such as Live Data and Run. How do they improve app development? Android app architecture components like LiveData and Room are part of the Android architecture components. LiveData is an observable data holder that allows UI components to observe changes in data and automatically update when data changes. It helps in creating reactive UIs and ensures that UI components are always up to date with the latest data. Room, on the other hand, 
is a SQLite database library that simplifies database management in Android apps. It provides compile-time verification of SQL queries and abstracts many of the low-level database operations. Together, LiveData and Room improve app development by promoting a clean, maintainable, and testable architecture, reducing boilerplate code, and enhancing data synchronization between the UI and data sources. How do you make network requests in Android, and what libraries or methods do you prefer for this task? In Android, you can make network requests using libraries like Retrofit or OKHTTP. Retrofit is a popular choice for building type-safe RESTful APIs. It simplifies the process of making network calls by converting JSON responses into Java slash Kotlin objects. OKHTTP OK is a low-level HTTP client for making network requests. It's often used in conjunction with Retrofit. Additionally, Android provides classes like AsyncTask, HTTP URL connection, and Volley for making network requests, but these are less recommended due to their limitations and complexities. When choosing a library or method, consider factors like ease of use, performance, and community support. Can you explain the concept of dependency injection and how it is implemented in Android using libraries like Dago or Hilt? Dependency injection, DI, is a design pattern that promotes loose coupling between classes by externalizing the creation and provisioning of dependencies. In Android, DI is used to provide components, such as services or repositories, to classes that depend on them. Libraries like Dagger and Hilt automate the DI process. Dagger generates dependency injection code at compile time based on annotations and modules defined in the code. Hilt is a more opinionated and simplified DI framework built on top of Dagger, tailored for Android. It offers annotations like at HiltView model and at Android EntryPoint to streamline DI in Android apps. By using DI, you can enhance code modularity, testability, and maintainability. What are the benefits of using RecyclerView over ListView in Android? RecyclerView offers several advantages over ListView in Android app development. Firstly, RecyclerView provides better performance through its use of the view holder pattern, which recycles view items and reduces memory usage. Secondly, RecyclerView offers more flexibility in customizing item layouts and animations, making it easier to create complex UIs. Thirdly, it supports both vertical and horizontal scrolling, which is useful for various layouts. Additionally, RecyclerView supports features like item decorations and item animations out of the box. Overall, Recycler View is the recommended choice for creating lists and grids in modern Android applications. How do you optimize the performance of a Recycler View with a large data set? To optimize the performance of a Recycler View with a large data set, I implement several strategies. Firstly, I use the view holder pattern to efficiently recycle views. Secondly, I implement pagination or endless scrolling to load data incrementally. Additionally, I consider data binding to minimize view updates. Finally, I profile the app using tools like Android Profiler to identify and address any performance bottlenecks. What is the purpose of ProGuard or R8 in Android development and how does it enhance app security and performance? ProGuard or R8 is a code shrinking and obfuscation tool used in Android development. Its purpose is to reduce the size of the APK, which enhances app performance by reducing the method count and overall size. Additionally, it obfuscates code, making it more challenging for reverse engineering. This enhances app security by making it difficult for attackers to understand the code and discover vulnerabilities. How can you ensure backward compatibility for Android apps, especially when using newer apps? Ensuring backward compatibility in Android apps is crucial. I use the Android support library, now Android X, 
to provide compatibility with older Android versions. Additionally, I use version checks to conditionally execute code based on the device's API level. I may also implement alternative implementations or use third-party libraries to replicate newer functionality on older devices while gracefully degrading features when necessary. Explain the concept of material design and how do you incorporate material design principles into your app's UI UX. Material design is a design language developed by Google that emphasizes clean, intuitive, and consistent user interfaces. To incorporate material design principles, I use material components for Android to access pre-built UI components. I adhere to principles like elevation, motion, and color schemes. I also focus on smooth transitions, responsive layouts, and intuitive navigation to create a cohesive and visually appealing user experience. Describe your experience with responsive UI design for different screen sizes and orientations. I have extensive experience with responsive UI design in Android. I design layouts using constraint layout to adapt to various screen sizes and orientations. I use guidelines, constraints, and responsive chains to ensure elements resize and reposition appropriately. Additionally, I use resource qualifiers to provide different layouts and assets for different screen configurations. Testing on various devices and emulators is also a key part of my responsive design process. What is the purpose of a constraint layout and how does it help in designing complex UI layouts? A constraint layout is a powerful layout manager in Android that simplifies designing complex UI layouts. It allows you to create flexible, responsive designs by defining relationships, constraints, between UI elements. This makes it easier to create layouts that adapt to different screen sizes and orientations. Constraint layout reduces the need for nested layouts and improves performance by efficiently positioning and sizing UI elements. Can you name some Android testing frameworks and tools? How do you perform unit testing and UI testing for your apps? Some Android testing frameworks and tools I use include Espresso for UI testing, JUnit for unit testing, and Mockito for mocking dependencies. I write unit tests for individual components and use Espresso for UI tests to simulate user interactions and verify app behavior. Continuous integration, CI, tools like Jenkins or Travis CI are valuable for automated testing, ensuring code quality through test suites. How do you handle background tasks in Android, such as fetching data or performing periodic updates? I use background processing techniques to handle tasks like data fetching or periodic updates. For asynchronous tasks, I often use Android's async task or libraries like RxJava for more complex scenarios. I also leverage Android Work Manager for scheduled background tasks, ensuring they run efficiently and consider factors like battery optimization. For long-running tasks, I may use foreground services to provide a seamless user experience. Explain the Android permission system and best practices for requesting and managing app permissions. The Android permission system governs access to sensitive device resources. Best practices for managing permissions include explaining the need for permissions to users, requesting permissions at runtime, if targeting Android 6.0+, and handling permission requests gracefully. I follow the principle of least privilege, requesting only the permissions required for app functionality. Additionally, I check for and handle permission results, and I provide fallback behavior when permissions are denied. Have you worked with Android Jetpack libraries? If so, can you name some of them and describe their use cases? Yes, I have extensive experience with Android Jetpack libraries. Some key libraries include Navigation, LiveData, ViewModel, and Room. Navigation simplifies app navigation by providing a single entry point and handling fragment transactions. 
Live data and view model are used to manage UI related data and handle configuration changes gracefully. Room is a powerful library for working with local databases, providing a convenient and type safe way to interact with SQLite databases. These libraries collectively improve app architecture, data handling, and user experience. Describe the process of publishing an Android app to the Google Play Store, including the necessary steps and best practices. Publishing an Android app on the Google Play Store involves several steps. First, you need to prepare your app for release, ensuring that it's thoroughly tested and optimized. Then, you generate a signed APK or app bundle. Next, create a Google Play developer account and pay the one-time registration fee. After that, you can create a listing for your app on the Google Play console, including screenshots, descriptions, and other details. Set pricing and distribution options, and configure in-app purchases if needed. Upload your APK or app bundle and fill out content rating questionnaires. Finally, submit your app for review, and once approved, it will be available on the Play Store. Best practices include providing clear app descriptions, offering regular updates, and responding to user reviews and feedback. How do you handle app localization and internationalization in Android? App localization and internationalization are essential for reaching a global audience. In Android, I use resource files and string resources to separate content from code. I create separate resource files for each language slash locale, allowing for easy translation. I also use the Android localization editor in Android Studio to manage translations efficiently. Additionally, I use the Locale class to dynamically load the appropriate resources based on the user's device settings. It's crucial to plan ahead for localization and use placeholders for dynamic content. Regularly testing the app in different languages and regions helps ensure a smooth user experience. Can you discuss strategies for optimizing battery usage and power efficiency in Android apps? Optimizing battery usage is critical for a positive user experience. Some strategies I employ include minimizing wake locks and background services, using Job Scheduler for scheduling tasks efficiently, and leveraging the Doze Mode and App Standby features in Android. I also optimize network requests by batching them, using background sync, and reducing polling frequency. Implementing the Android Background Location Limits Guidelines for Location Updates helps save power. Additionally, I use tools like Battery Historian to identify power-hungry components and optimize code accordingly. Regularly testing power usage on different devices and Android versions is essential. Describe a challenging Android project you've worked on, highlighting the technical and design decisions you made to overcome obstacles and deliver a successful app. One challenging project I worked on involved developing a location-based social networking app with real-time updates and a complex user interface. To address performance issues, I adopted a modular architecture, separating the app into smaller modules with their own responsibilities. I used Kotlin coroutines for asynchronous tasks, improving the app's responsiveness. For real-time updates, I integrated WebSocket technology, allowing users to receive instant notifications. In terms of design, I focused on a user-friendly UI with material design principles, ensuring a smooth and engaging user experience. I also implemented efficient data caching and prefetching mechanisms to reduce network requests. Ultimately, the project was a success, with improved performance and user satisfaction. Why is it worth subscribing to our YouTube channel? Our YouTube channel provides valuable and informative content on a variety of topics, including expert interview questions and answers that can help viewers prepare for job interviews and improve their skills in various industries.